<clears throat> All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another discussion of the Edan Trilogy. I am thrilled to be joined today by my three guests, and they are John Mauro, the reviewer and glass scientist uh, and professor. Hello, John. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. You made a good impression last time, so I guess oh, I, I want to have you back. <laughs> And the uh, next guest uh, is going to be Mark Lawrence, the author. Um, also, I just realized all three of you are doctors. So all four of us are doctors here today. Uh, that's amazing. I did not actually plan that. Uh, so it's the, it's the, the doctor day here, uh, I guess. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you so much, Mark Lawrence, for being here. I have said many times that you are one of my very favorite writers of all time. And I think that might actually be true of uh, John and Angela as well. So definitely, <laughs> this is a, a thrill to have you here. Thank you for coming. Pleasure. I had fun last time. I'll endeavor to have fun this time. Good, good. Yes, yes. So yes, all three of you have also been guests on Dear Dr. Fantasy. So that's another thing you have in common. So yeah, that's fantastic. All right. Uh, and our other panelist today is Angela from the channel Do Unicorns Read? Oh, I should mention too, Mark Lawrence has a YouTube channel as well. Uh, so we have two other YouTubers here. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, I will put links to the to, in the description to all those two channels uh, for sure. But Angela, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. And thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me. Oh, it, the pleasure is mine. The pleasure is mine. And, and I'm doing this out of uh, gratitude to my readers, also to have some discussions out there on the Adan Trilogy in case anybody wants to hear that sort of thing. And uh, hopefully pique some people's interest as well, because we are going to start non-spoiler. So I'm going to allow each of my guests to make some observation or ask a question, um, anything of that nature that is non-spoiler to begin with, uh, roughly sort of related to the Adan trilogy. And then we'll proceed to have spoilers for the first book only, and we'll restrict ourselves to spoilers for The Way of Adan. And then we will move on to spoilers for The Prophet of Adan, book two, <laughs> excuse me, and for the third book, we're not actually going to get into spoilers. We're just going to uh, make some non-spoiler um, observations or questions uh, simply because not all the guests have read book three yet. Uh, so we're going to, yep, <laughs> which is perfectly fine. Uh, in fact, I think John is the only one who's actually finished it. Uh, Angela is close, I think, close-ish. I am close-ish. Um, yeah, I didn't do my homework. Uh -oh. Chase. <laughs> That's what happens. That's okay. We are just happy to have everybody here. So all that said, let's get going here. So John, I'm going to just go in order, but again, you know, we're, we're going to uh, be flexible here. If anybody wants to jump in at any time, feel free, but we'll start with you, John. Uh, oh, what right. uh, non-spoiler questions or comments would you like to make? So if you don't mind, I would actually like to start with a question about these beautiful covers. So oh, sure. I, like many people, I think was immediately captured by the beautiful stained glass covers, which of course mean a lot to me as a glass scientist, someone who just, you know, works on this for a living. Um, and I'm curious to know the story of, you know, how you settled on this cover design and the beautiful cover art by Kyra Gregory, cover design by Jack Shepard. Um, and how you chose the characters to feature here and also the color schemes. You've got this great multicolored scheme here. It yeah. becomes kind of, um, you know, orangish, reddish here in Prophet of Edan. And yeah. then my favorite is uh, this cover for Return to Edan, where it's got this darker, uh, melancholy color tone. So could you tell us about that? Sure, yeah. Um, so early in the process, I had engaged uh, a dear friend of my daughter's, Kira Gregory to do the cover art. And I also engaged uh, Jack Shepard, who, by the way, also did the map of Jormanland in there. Brilliant, really lovely person. Um, so <clears throat> early on, Kira had done a few, I, I gave the ideas for whatever is on the cover. I said, this is the scene I would like you to do, Kira. Um, and I, I gave Kira the scene in question uh, the the from the book so that they would have the uh, 
the, the scene, you know, the, and I don't think Kira read the entire book, but had at least the scene. So, and I would explain what it was and all that. And, and pretty much said, you know, and go, you do what you want from there. It became at some stage after a few designs for the first book, I said to Kira, you know what? I think because of Kira's particular art style is very inspired by, um, uh wood engravings and things with thicker lines and stuff like that if you were to see their art you would see um a, a, kind of a style that you can can kind of trace to that um kind of influence um and it's really brilliant stuff mm -hmm. so i said what if we did a stained glass window because religion is a pretty central thing in the trilogy and that would definitely be a nod to the whole religious holy war aspect of all this. I thought, well, can we make it a stained glass window? And Kira said, sure. And Jack chimed in and said, actually, yes. Um, and I made a video recently with Jack and he, where he explained how he layered, you know, because Kira would give the actual like design and the colors are all Kira's. So I have to, I, I, am, I love the colors. Um, Kira has a gift with color. So that was definitely their contribution. But Jack said, yeah, I can make this look more like a stained glass window. Mm -hmm. And apparently, I didn't know this until I had my chat with Jack, but it took 600 layers of stuff uh, in, in, the, in a computer. You know, I, I don't understand these things very well. But during my discussion with him, he revealed how he made the cover design, taking Kira's art and putting all these different layers over it, making it look like stained glass which I thought was just fantastic. Um, so that was part of that process. But for, for, yeah, for each of these scenes, this is the, a lot of people wonder who this is. This is actually the elf um, mm -hmm. from the first book, early in the first book. The elf that, uh, well, I can, I don't think it's a spoiler really, the elf that Day Raven encounters. Um, and the, the clue is there's a little raven on the back there. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and then on the second cover, we have Sequara, and I try to use a scene that could somehow, almost like a prologue, convey the tone of the, the book as a whole. So I felt like the, the woodland scene was appropriate for the first one, introducing a sense of wonder and mystery maybe, and then having a more slightly more violent image uh, in book two, which is a, a faster paced kind of more um, exciting, I guess, read. A lot of people say, even though it's bigger than the first book, it reads faster. Um, and then got a dragon on the back, of course. Dragons! <laughs> <laughs> so we've got uh, that going on book two. And then book three, this is a very specific scene once again. Um, and I felt it just conveyed the whole tone of the book, um, this particular, and the, the yeah, colors... Probably. The only instruction I gave Kira was you can go all Van Gogh on the stars, um, mm -hmm. which they definitely did. Uh, so yeah, that, but the colors and everything else are all Kira's and, and the, the glass effect is Jack's. So yeah. Well, they did a beautiful job. Oh, I think they both are uh, brilliant at what they do. I'm very grateful to have worked with them. Yeah. So thank you for that question. I, I love talking about the covers. <laughs> Uh, it's a chance to tell the reader, here's kind of, and I, I feel like they, these covers do perhaps distinguish the trilogy. They're not very typical fantasy covers. Um, at least I don't think they are. Um, yeah, they have a timeless quality to them. So. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. So Mark, uh, what non-spoiler uh, observation or question would you like to toss in? That's a, a question, um, unsurprisingly, about writing. Um, ah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I've gone on record to say that uh, people giving writing advice with authority makes me itch because there are just so many approaches to to writing. Um, True. And as I've discovered, so many different ways of experiencing the world in your own head. So that's obviously going to project onto how we then try and transcribe it onto a piece of paper. Um, but the thing that has amazed me with with your journey is that you spent 18 years writing these books and I don't know how much writing you did before this is part of the question but uh -huh. how how much writing you did before that um but when I 
learn to write and i mean some people just leap in you know, there's some 18 year olds who are selling millions of books making lots of people happy and they just went click and, and they they were but i had to learn how to do it and so i um and my approach is is to write something and you know if, if i can see it's full of nonsense or somebody comes along and reads it has criticisms i don't change it i just abandon it and and move on so i've got a, a sort of long line of reps in in, in my rear view mirror um, and hopefully each one is slightly better than, than the next. Huh. Um, so you obviously didn't spend 18 years writing this because you only wrote one line a day. You okay. must have come back to it and 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 changed things and possibly uh, like when you saw a piece that was written 10 years ago, you thought, no, I, I'm a much better writer now. I can, because I've had all this practice, I can uh, I can come back to it and change it. So one question is, how much of the original Ooh. draft if you like is you know are there whole pages or just whole paragraphs or whole lines that have survived all of that time um yeah yeah and and because i don't know how much feedback you got in this process hmm. but if you weren't getting a lot of feedback then it's harder to understand where you've made mistakes and to correct them um, were you just relying on your own changing view or was somebody telling you, uh, you know, this bit could be tighter? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. So I started this thing in 2004, summer of 2004. I had a complete draft of what's now books one and two by 2007. And I started to look for an agent, took me five years to find an agent. In the meantime, I was tweaking it. By early, by the late, actually it was the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, I had an agent. The first thing the agent said was, this is great. I'd like to represent you, but this is not one book. It's two books and you need to make it two books. So I said, okay. <laughs> and I made it two books and that took a little while because uh, I'm not writing all year round. I teach and I have a full-time job. And so I'm really primarily writing in the summers. And yeah, in the process of all that, uh, there were a lot of changes. You know, book one used to, the first chapter used to be what's now chapter three. So I started with uh, chapter three, The Hunt, which starts out life for life, blood for blood. Those lines have not changed. Um, so that that's pretty much what I wrote from the very beginning. But I didn't have the prologue. I didn't have what's now chapters one and two. Um, I just started out with that boom and realized later on, hmm, maybe I need to, fill in what happened there a little bit. Um, and so that those are later chapters. In fact, chapter two, the chapter where I introduced Sequara is one of the last chapters I wrote. Um, I probably wrote that even after I had written the third book. So this is a lot of going back, changing things, adding chapters and trying to, because you're right during the, those 18 years, I, I hope I got better at writing. And I realized mm, I need to work, rework this because it doesn't quite mesh with this newer stuff. Um, so that was going on a lot for sure. Do you have a beta readers or beta reader? Uh, my first real reader was that agent. Um, okay. That was the first real, I mean, I, I had friends and family members who read my early efforts, but, and, and they were very kind to do so, but mostly it was like, wow, this is really great, you know? Um, so <laughs> it wasn't so much of a, um, I don't know if your, your friends and, and relatives are critical uh, of you when, when you show them your early writing, but um... I never did. No, I, I okay. think you need, a, a, you need someone who doesn't <clears throat> care if they hurt your, your feelings. Uh, exactly. Otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. And that agent was that, I mean, he's very good at what he does. He's, he's actually, He's not so much in fantasy, but he does have some fantasy uh, cred, uh, if you will. He, he's the agent for Christopher Paolini, for example. Um, um, so, you know, who's wildly successful, um, uh, obviously. Um, but yeah, he's um, he was very helpful. And then I sort of started to think after years of working since 2012 with this agent, we weren't getting anybody, you know, in publishing very interested. And when I gave him what became after taking his advice and reworking first book, um, he did a pitch of the first book. 
nothing. So I said, all right, well, I'll do the second book and um, you know, we'll uh, we'll see how it goes then. And we did the same thing with the second book. Nothing. And then had I you written uh, had you written before? Like had you written short stories or oh yeah, so not really much. I <laughs> I took the scenic route to becoming a, a fantasy writer. I uh, so I read Tolkien when I was 12 and decided that's what I want to do. I wanted I want to be like J.R.R. Tolkien. And so I went to graduate school, learned Old English and Old Norse and other archaic dead languages and, and traveled the world. And, uh, you know, I learned, I learned Welsh, you know, I did, I did all this stuff. Um, and uh, then when I got to my early 30s, uh, 2004, uh, I said, all right, now I'm going to be a writer. Well, I, I had neglected to do one thing, which is to learn how to actually write a modern fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of what uh, and I wrote a dissertation, uh, which really doesn't help much uh, <laughs> for writing a compelling fantasy read. Sorry, academia, but you know, it's different, different sort of uh, creature, really a dissertation. So uh, but yeah, I, I had to learn. So I read a lot of books on how to write. I read like, you know, John Gardner's uh, books and I read uh, other books, textbooks. I, I got a hold of. And I started to actually read more fantasy. I read a lot more, including your books, uh, Mark. Uh, by 2007 or so, I was starting to say, you know what? I need to read more fantasy because I read a lot of Tolkien. I read a lot of Le Guin. Ursula Le Guin is a big hero of mine. Um, and But other than those two, I can't say any um, strong influences were there. I'd read other stuff. I had read Raymond Feist and I had read, you know, um, well, William Morris, of course, and a bit spotty here and there. And I thought, you know, I need to read some more modern writers. And so you were definitely one of them. I, I basically look, went online, looked up, you know, best modern fantasy or something like that. And you were on a bunch of those lists. So I said, oh, I'll try this Mark Lawrence guy. Um, he sounds all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I read, uh, you know, I read your stuff. I read uh, Joe Abercrombie's stuff. I read N.K. Jemisin a little later. I read Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. I read, um, you know, just a ton of stuff. Uh, Steven Erickson's uh, Malazan Book of the Fallen. Uh, just whatever I saw on the list, I just started reading voraciously and realized, yeah, I'm not exactly writing modern fantasy here, am I? Yeah. You and I got our agents about the same time. I think I got mine at the very end of 2010. Oh, wow. And your kind of book was definitely not what they were looking for. Nope. And my kind of book was definitely was what they were looking for. Yeah. I didn't know this because I, I wasn't really plugged, like you, I wasn't plugged into to what was going on. But you can see how that's a roll of the dice. It's a question of timing that yep. I happened to produce something at the dark end of the spectrum and that was exactly what they wanted and they were sort of actively looking for it whereas at that point Tolkien-esque or Tolkien-inspired fantasy was not on the list so it would have been a, a tough sale to, yeah. to have made in those days. Yep, yep. And today as well, I think, still. I don't think it's... Oh, yeah, still... no, I don't, I don't think it's... Though John Gwynn is, has kind of broken the... Um, yeah, the trend. I, I think he's more of an exception though than the rule. Um, I think so. Yeah. A, a lot of people have compared what I'm doing to John Gwynn's writing too, which I find incredibly uh, exciting because uh, I love his book. I've read everything he's published at this point. Um, so, um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think it. Um, my timing wasn't very good <laughs> for doing what I was doing. Lucky for me, self-publishing is way more viable than it's ever been. So, um, and I happen to have started this little YouTube channel. Um, and that I have to say was, again, I, none of this was really planned. Uh, so I'm glad it worked out though, the way it, it has. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. But yeah, my process is, has been learning a lot along the way. And un you and I are kind of opposites in many ways when it comes to our writing styles, Mark. I, I'd spent a ton of time drawing a map, about a hundred pages of world history and mythology. And, you know, I was writing all these languages and blah, blah, blah. Well, I have questions about that too, but I, I feel I should um, let Angela get, get a word in. <laughs> and I know your approach is very different from that, uh, so. Um, and and instead of probably doing the sensible thing like you did, 
and saying, okay, that was a good practice. Now let me try another story. I just kept going back to my story again and again and again and again and trying to make it the best thing I could. Um, and that that is not not the wrong thing to do. It is for some people the right thing to do. You were honing your sword till it was sharp enough to do the job. Yeah, yeah, yep. That's what I did. I just I'm I'm kind of just stubborn. I, I'll keep banging my head on the wall until it cracks. So, <laughs> so, yep. So yes, uh, Angela. What uh, yeah. spoiler-free thing do you want to talk about? Um, has a little bit to do as well with writing, um, but okay. more with with the research part that writers will do and have to do. Yeah. Um, so what was your favorite thing to research? And also, did you have something that uh, you really hated when you started to kind of like get into this process of finding out about it, where you were thinking, oh my God, why did I ever thought that this needs to be in the book and <laughs> yeah was it perhaps even scrapped then <laughs> <laughs> wow okay so the first part i can honestly say that i did i had to do a lot of research and and i still probably made mistakes um and i've been told by friends uh who uh have read the books that mm, actually that's not how horses work or mm, that's not how rock climbing works or you know that that's sort yeah of i saw your discussion yeah. with uh, murphy Joanna. yes yes <laughs> and murphy getting all worked up about this climbing she was, scene. She was not e e extremely uh convinced by the details of my rock climbing scene but i i think for somebody who doesn't know about rock climbing it works you know uh, so, but anyway, yeah, th there are certain things I could have done better, I guess, researching, but other things I think I did a pretty decent job. I have a friend who is a blacksmith, uh, for example, uh, a good friend from high school. Mm -hmm. um, he's a brilliant guy. He makes these wonderful, all kinds of, I can't afford his stuff though. He's too expensive for me. Um, but, uh, he, he makes beautiful items. Uh, his name is Lucian Avery. Um, and he has a website, I think if anyone's curious, Lucian Avery Blacksmith or .com or something like that. But anyway, he, I, I asked him how, because I have a scene in um, the first book where the characters visit a forge and I wanted to make it kind of accurate. So whatever I, I that's my attempt to describe what my friend told me uh, the forge would have been like, you know, so he also educated me to some degree on sailing. So I, I I'm pretty sure I, I don't have a deep knowledge of, of sailing and of nautical terminology and stuff, but hopefully convincing enough for the layperson. Um, so, so yeah, yeah that was, okay. that's so those, those are the highlights and stuff yeah. that you really like to get into, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Anything where, when you started, you then thought, uh, no, I don't need this in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of something that got tedious. Um, I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head where I was like, oh, not this again, uh, while I was writing anyway. Um, but, huh. I mean, there, there were certain things that I had to go back and fix, but I never really minded doing that. Mm. Uh, you know, I, yeah. the idea of course is you try to make your world as convincing as you can. So you don't spoil the immersion for anybody. So, you know, most people reading that rock climbing scene hopefully don't blink but you know if you're murphy you're you you, you throw the book down you say what is he doing you know and you're you're out of that I didn't story have any problems with it but yeah. um one thought occurred um that i thought uh mm. yeah okay frostbite perhaps because he's uh -huh. quite high up that mountain no? um, and then only comes out of all of this with a bit of a ruined fingernail and i was like hmm, he's a lucky yeah. chap well, one thing I do know about uh, hiking and climbing is you do generate a lot of your own body heat. Um, so, um, but yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> when it's really cold, I don't think that'll help you. <laughs> yeah. Well. Anyway, yeah, I can't. I can't claim to have a hundred percent historical accuracy on, or even medical accuracy in, in all things. But, but uh, just the the um. The climbing in the second book we're talking yeah, about here. Yeah, it's in the second book. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we're doing non-spoilers, and of course we're talking yeah. about stuff. <laughs> I was just try, trying to remember where the climbing was. And the climbing is always in book two, Mark. You know that. Yeah. Yeah, oh, exactly. Book one is that we're kind of getting out of the house, and then in book two... <laughs> book two is the transcendence, so that would be where the climbing happens. Yeah, uh, so... 
Yeah. yeah. But thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so I guess that means we're going to signal we're we're going to start on spoilers for the way of Adan for book one. And uh, John, unless anyone wants to make any comments on any of those uh, things we were just talking about, I think we're good. Okay, John, way of Adan. What uh, would oh, you like right. to So this uh, circles back to Mark's question a little bit and your response to that about, you know, adding the prologue and the chapters towards the beginning. Um, I was actually surprised by how dark the book is um, yeah. at the beginning. Um, did you plan it that way or did you sort of intentionally go back and make it darker based on, you know, feedback you were getting during this, um, you know, this process of, of talking with your agent or how, how did you find, you know, the right balance there between um, kind of the darkness and the hope? Yeah, I... It's a, it's a good question. I think from the beginning, I did want to be, and this is something that I respect and, and enjoy about what people call grimdark. And I'm not going to get into the definition of all of that um, because I know how um, that can be not, not necessarily contentious, but not everyone agrees what grimdark is. Um, but I like the honesty that you find about violence in a lot of what people label grimdark. Um, I like the honesty about the PTSD. I like the honesty about the depression. I, I, I think that's something I found um, to be compelling. That's why there are certain grimdark uh, uh, series uh, like the Broken Empire, uh, for example, that I I've, I've, have found to be important reads in my life um, because I, I believe it's important to confront that there's a place in literature to confront violence in a way that is just honest. And a lot of the fantasy that I grew up loving either glosses over the violence or uh, may even uh, idealize it to some degree. Um, and that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted this to feel painful. Uh, I wanted to show that there are repercussions to violence. I wanted to explore it. I think I do the most exploring of consequences and repercussions in the third book, mm. but throughout, uh, I wanted to be as honest as I could based on my limited experience. I've never been in combat. You know, I've never, I never, uh, never had to be in a situation where I've had to take a life um, or anything like that. So, um, but as honest as I could about these things. Um, so that was my intention, I guess. And so when I start out with I and mean, we're doing spoilers for the way of a dance. So when I start out with a prologue where three priests martyr themselves, and then I have a boy who's brutally killed right at the beginning of the next chapter, the first chapter, I'm trying to tell the reader, this is how I'm going to handle violence in this series. Um, and I want to look at where it comes from. I want to look at the consequences because those two things, by the way, are very much related. That boy would never have been killed if those priests hadn't been you know, uh, involved in a very broad effort to crank up a war machine, you know, that there are, uh, it, it's often called collateral damage these days, right? That that it, it, these kinds of things affect lives. There are ripples all over the place. And so I wanted to be honest about that. Um, and so that was my intention um, from the, 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 the prologue. I also wanted to have a, a contrast with the Sequara chapter where she saves a little girl um and and heels um so that was a deliberate um juxtaposition if you will um yeah yeah that was done really well and you know getting back to you know the definition of of grim dark and you know the role of hope my favorite definition actually comes from mark um and he said uh grim dark is often called hopeless but in doing so people miss that it isn't apathetic it is for me characterized by defiance in the absence of hope Grimdark is often called nihilistic, but this misses the idea that you can accept a nihilistic truth and still choose to die for a principle you know is an emotional construct. Um, and I think that, you know, you you kind of, you address these questions, um, you know, within your kind of, I don't know if you would call it a dark epic, epic fantasy or just an epic fantasy. There's definitely dark aspects to it. Um, but I think you... Um, address this there too. And the last part of Mark's definition, um, he's saying that uh, Grimdark is painted by the disapproving, um, that it's the literature of surrender to the inevitable. When it is in truth, 
the story of the battle against it, sharpened by the knowledge that there's no ultimate victory to be had. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when we get to especially return to Edan, that's a major theme of that book. Oh, yeah. In a big way. Yeah, I, I've never thought of my trilogy as being grimdark. Um, I started seeing the word used more with when people were reading the third book. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, like, oh, okay, that's interesting. I, I do feel that um, I hope that uh, there's people will emerge from the trilogy with a sense of beauty and wonder and, and all of that as Absolutely. well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't mind. I, I have no objection. If someone says, I think this is grimdark, I have no problem with that, but um, I never have myself thought of it that way. Um, that said, I think the idea that it's epic fantasy with uh, some influence from grimdark, I, I can say George R. R. Martin was, a, 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 I, I failed to mention him earlier, but he definitely is one of the writers that probably helped to ground me more in modern fantasy, I would say. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if people agree or disagree that his writing is grimdark. Uh, I always thought it kind of was, but... Um, I think I'm, it's definitely grimdark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's uh, that's how I would answer that. Great, thank you. So you just got quoted there, Mark. Uh <laughs> Would you like to follow up on that or you have your own uh, question or? Uh... I think I'll, I'll dive into a question. Okay. I'll actually start okay. with a small ramble. I will state a misconception, which you don't need to correct because I will correct myself. And then okay. I have a question. Very good. So um, that's my cover to the thing. <laughs> you, yes. And you know, I get um, obviously sent a, a lot of things. One observation I have is, and it, there's a certain fear in being sent stuff by people you know, because an observation I have come to over many years is that uh, the, the correlation which you would expect to be strong between um, the sort of obvious intelligence and good communicator and funny and, and well-spoken and being able to write is not nearly as strong as you'd think it, it would be. And that you can get very quiet people who, who never speak up and never make you laugh who on a page can make you laugh and cry and all this, and you can get people who are great communicators and they come to the page and it, it's it's not as good as you thought it was going to be. No. Um, so so I always pick these things up with a bit of trepidation because I don't like to um, say nasty things about work <laughs> by, pe by people I like. I don't like to say it about anybody, but, but it's, it's especially... Um, and I got to... Uh, chapter three i think is where we where we meet day raven and for a moment my heart fell because we had um this fairly in the first instance generic looking uh warrior with fairly generic looking um ambitions and he was called day raven and i'm thinking this is pretty much like night storm blood or max power is it's sort of like a an over-the-top fancy name now i I do now know that it, yeah. it comes from um, the epic poem um, and uh, Beowulf crushes this guy with his bare hands and, and <laughs> yes. it's, a legitimate, it's a legitimate old English name, although a translation of it at least. So, and from then moving into that chapter and, and, and the later chapters, it becomes rapidly apparent that actually what Day Raven is having to do he's got the ambition of being a you know a fairly generic swordsman i want to get better i want to be as good as my dad i want to you know have his sword and and marry this nice girl and 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 be a hero um but it's a process of having to give up those things yep. um and so he has to give up his ambition to to be in the front lines fighting he has to give up his ambition to marry the girl and in the end, he has to rather symbolically give away his father's sword yeah. and withdraw from from the world to a, to a large extent. And this is um, quite a uh, it's it's a risky move. And my question is about the risk of it. It reminded me a lot of in in tone of um, uh, Robin Hobb's Soldier Son trilogy, where the main guy goes to battle school. He wants to be a warrior. He's good at it. And his life just veers off into a very different course where everything he wants is frustrated and he's coerced into this other path. Uh, Day Raven's not 
quite so coerced. He actually is surprisingly good spirited about it. He, you know, he puts up a struggle and he's disappointed. But right. but question is that that's actually a a more intellectual um, thematic approach that can lift a book out of the commercial zone. Like Soldier Son is is Robin Hobb's least successful trilogy, mm. um, and because most fantasy readers a vast number of them want the hero to do exactly what day raven wanted to go and do right. and they would have been behind that and they would have been potentially disappointed in in the veering away and so i just wondered if you ever thought about that or if it was just a you didn't think about it because you thought I don't care if I'm disappointing these people who want that. I'm giving them something more intellectual uh, I, um, and and more more literary worth, but maybe less commercial. Yeah, no, that was very deliberate. Uh, as it turns out, Day Raven is a pretty poor soldier uh, in the uh, the battle um, uh, of um, Yarfine in Cargillian at the climax of this book. He turns out to be actually a pretty bad soldier. Uh, because he feels empathically what's going on in the other person's head uh, and he experiences their experiences. And that doesn't work very well on a battlefield where you're supposed to be dehumanizing the enemy, not... not. Uh... Oh, that's because he's being sabotaged by having the, the yes. elf. So yes. He probably would have been a much better soldier if he'd been allowed to get on with it. He probably would have been a more passable soldier, although I I suspect he never would have been a, a brilliant one. Um, I th I think he probably would have been okay if he had, had made himself do it. But yeah, the whole elf shard thing definitely put a damper on his plans. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, if this in, in my mind at least, if this had been maybe a more uh, typical narrative, um, you could have had Imhar as, a, as the hero, or maybe Orvandil would be a, the much more Conan, maybe like you know hero of a a more typical. Um, and he, they have their arcs as well, but um, they're not at the, the center of, of the story. And so, yeah, Day Raven is in many ways, um, and we can talk about this when we talk about book two as well, because um, I think that, I hope that the end of book two also raises some questions as well. Um, but, but yeah, by the, by the, the first book, by the end, I hope the reader has figured out, okay, this guy's not going to be a very typical fantasy hero. A lot of Day Raven's journey is very internal. Um, and, and and I don't think it's a spoiler to say in book two, there are a lot of external things happening and then quite deliberately juxtaposed with Day Raven's internal journey. Um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of things that I wanted to think about, questions of uh, connection and transcendence are things that are much more internal um, so yeah, that's, it was very deliberate, um, uh, for sure. Um, I do tend to plan things and I thought about that and I thought that by having other characters around Day Raven, I could do kind of both. I could have the, the inward journey alongside the more hopefully exciting, um, um, swashbuckling stuff that's going on. And it is, I mean, the, the whole, um, story is taking place with the backdrop of a holy war so um yeah yeah in fact i had to edit out some believe it or not uh i i found myself editing out uh battle scenes and scripts of violence i thought you know what this this does not need another battle scene i can i can just skip to the end here and and give it as a kind of okay the aftermath you know uh and i think that's actually more effective sometimes than trying to I, it's fun sometimes to write a battle scene and get into the details, but it gets tedious after a while. Um, so um, it, I think it was, it's, I'm more interested in what leads up to it and what happens afterwards than the actual event itself. But yeah. Yes, so, I mean, you wrote a book I enjoyed much more because of the way you did it. Yeah. I'm just feeling that you probably left a lot of potential readers because there were just so many who want yeah, what it was a sort of bait and switch that you thought you were getting one thing, and then <laughs> you, you didn't. And, and 
Yeah, I did do that uh, for sure. I don't know how literary my, it's hard for me to judge myself, um, how literary this trilogy is. Um, and literary, literary. You think so, John? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know because uh, yeah, I'm the worst judge probably of that. Um, but uh, in terms of, in, on the spectrum of fantasy being, you know, which is labeled genre fiction, you have certain writers who are definitely on the more literary end, like, you know, maybe Neil Gaiman or Ursula Le Guin. And then you have some who are more on the more, what, pulpy end, I guess, um, who who tend to get more, you know, the action and, and maybe aren't as deliberate with the uh, thematic work. Um, and uh, I don't know where I fall in that, but. Well, yeah. Neither of the ends of those spectrums is a, is a bad thing. I'm, so I'm not saying yes. one's better than Yeah, to I me, agree. The bones of the, the the two books I've read are, are very literary, uh -huh. but on a smaller scale, it's more traditional. So uh -huh. that you know you are you're not being beaten over the head with literary concepts or, or sort of deep ponderings on a paragraph by paragraph thing, but the the actual <laughs> journey and the message that that you take from the whole the thing as a whole, I felt was 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 lit very literary. Okay, cool. So I, to me, you're like sitting halfway between Anna Smith Spark and Andrew D. Meredith. So, um, right. you know, in common with Anna Smith Spark, who also a PhD, um, you know, she has this incredible knowledge of old English and Welsh and, and so on. And everything that she writes is just so perfectly honed that you just, you can't help but read it out loud because of not just what she's saying, but how she's saying it. And, you know, she's giving this, um, you know, different, more emotional, introspective twist on the classic fantasy. So you you definitely shared that in common with her. Um, but your tone is is a little bit more like the Andrew D. Meredith type of tone, which is more, um, more you know, classic Tolkien-esque uh, type of fantasy. So I, I would sort of put you there, but they are both, um, you know, quite literary from my point of view. Okay, so more on the the literary end of the spectrum, I guess. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, that means I probably won't be able to quit my day job as soon, though. I guess. <laughs> so, darn it! All right. Well, Angela, what would you like to ask about the way of Eden, or or? Um, observe? I have one of those, let's say, simple questions where I hope it gets a complex answer. Okay. Um, and that's about the name that the religion has, not the uh, the way, not Idan. So um, what's the linguistic background for that word? Or is it just made up or? Idan. Hmm. Yeah, yes. the word itself, yeah. That is, that's a great question. You're the first person to ask me that. And um, the answer is, I just made it up. Uh, okay, but but that said, I liked the sound of it because I thought obviously Eden. It's easily confused. Yeah, yeah. Eden. Mm. And so again, that has a religious resonance to it, I think. Mm. But it simply means that's their their name for God, you know. Um, so uh, according to that, at least that one faith. Um, yeah, one, I was just one. wondering because, like, I mean, a lot of um, <clears throat> names that occur and also the languages that occur in your book have some kind like um let's say real life linguistic yeah. link you know? yeah so i was yeah. wondering if idan has as well or did it come to you in the dream yeah no that one i can't say i had a particular etymological uh yeah. story behind uh though yes yeah, you're aware uh the the uh cultures of the Mark and Torland and Elland, those are very much based on Old English, their personal names and their place names. The Theos are very much Old Norse. Uh, the uh, Andumea kingdoms have a very South Asian, uh, like somebody who would speak Hindi or Nepali would probably understand a conversation in Andumaic. Um, and okay. the- uh, I'll try my neighbor, she's from India, so let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and whereas the, uh, yeah, the, the Kargilis and the Adonis, that's a, that's a Celtic inspired, uh, yeah. Welsh especially. Um, and you recognize probably this is later on, this is book two, but the, the language of the Ilarchai as, uh, I think you could probably, oh, yeah, that's, um, that. yeah. yeah, being a German speaker, <laughs> you could probably understand a lot of that. Um, so, so yeah, but with the, the, the word Idan, I can't say there was a particular, thing I was trying to do other than this sounds cool let's do this okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. plus I do think that yeah, the similarity to the word Eden I thought mm, yeah I was a bit surprised when I heard you um 
pronounce it the first time because I would have pronounced it more like Eden than Idan. So yeah, yeah. I guess I'm trying to just, and I don't care how people pronounce it. Honestly, I've heard you know Idan mm. and you know all kinds of stuff. So, uh, but I I tend to say Idan. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so back to you, John. I guess we're moving on to the prophet. Avidan. Um, so yes. what, uh, what would you like to say about this one? All right. So um, to me, this is like the book of transcendence. And it's, it's such a, a personal journey for Day Raven. And you know, there's one particular chapter, I think it was 26 in here. I actually texted you after I read it. I was like, wow, this is this is like the best thing that I've read in this series so far. That was just about his um his journey towards achieving um almost a nirvana type of state. And, you know, there, there's a lot of religious um, influence throughout the trilogy. I would say the prophet of Idan um, is where the, the Buddhist influence particularly comes to light. And I would argue that return to Idan is, is kind of more towards the Christianity and of the spectrum, although, you know, they're both present in both books. Um, but one of the key questions that Day Raven has to grapple with, and I think we all have to, to grapple with in our lives, is attachment versus detachment. Mm. And, you know, Buddhism and Christianity have different answers to that question. I they I both have, recognize yeah, it as a very important question. So, it, you know, in Buddhism, it's, it's more of a complete detachment from worldly things to achieve, um, you know, the state of nirvana. In Christianity, it's it's more of a a spectrum right there's like your relationship with god is the most important beyond any attachments either even with your family members your loved ones and so on but you know those attachments are still important and then there are the unhealthy attachments like um you know attachment to worldly things like or you know money <laughs> or stuff like that and you know day raven struggles with this and he forms um, you know, these earthly attachments, especially with Saquara and his relationship with her. Um, and I would just like to know your perspective on, on this question of detachment versus attachment and how you used, I think you used the writing of this trilogy to explore that issue and what have you learned in the process? Oh, wow. This is the big question. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I grew up uh, in a Christian household. Uh, my father is a pastor, uh, and and I have a grandfather and a great grandfather who are pastors as well. So it's very much a deep family tradition. So I grew up with the Christian answers to these big questions. Obviously, as I got older and traveled and learned, I became more and more interested in the uh, the Eastern answers to these questions. Um, and as you correctly said, I think that. <clears throat> There's a dialogue in a way in this series between the Christian answers and the Buddhist answers. And I'm trying to explore that dialogue in here. Um, and I've always felt that, well, I, the way I like to put it is, and I think you and I may have texted about this as, as well. Imagine you're an ethereal being, timeless, and you're observing this planet and you're seeing all the creatures you're seeing all of history at once and i think it's possible that uh it would occur to you that the most destructive species ever to inhabit this planet is us as humans right that we've done a lot of damage and you look at how much pain and suffering we inflict not only on each other but on the rest of the world how many other species we've annihilated you know um so just from that perspective i could see where you might conclude that I could make this world a little better by just getting rid of this one species, you know, wave my magic wand and they're all gone and everybody else is probably going to be happier for it. Um, and, and the planet might be healthier, uh, more sustainable for life. Um, so that's a perspective that obviously we humans might feel a little uneasy about <laughs> since it would involve our annihilation. Um, so I, you look at the question of suffering and there is a certain logic to the Buddhist uh, response, which is to say, well, you're suffering because you're attached. Your attachment is the root cause of your suffering. 
And I can see that and I can, uh, you know, there's a part of me though that screams in rebellion, but I love, you know, the, the people that are in my life and that's attachment. Okay, if that's attachment, then I'm going to have attachment. I love the, you know, I love the beauty of the, the you know, the forest behind me here. I, I there, you know, Life is wonderful. I, I want to embrace it, you know. Um, so I, I've always kind of just wanted to get into, uh, if I could, find a way to resolve that, I guess, for myself. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do in here uh, is uh, from that ethereal otherworldly perspective, um, yeah, we could get rid of all that suffering. You know, if you just take away all that attachment, take away all that ego, because it really comes down to ego, doesn't it? Um, a lot of the suffering that happens in the world is because it's about me and what I need so if you need this thing that I want too bad, cause I need it too, you know, I'm going to take it from you. And that kind of, uh, yeah, we, we may have, um, our, our, our tribes have gotten bigger throughout history. Um, but we're still very obviously look at the world today. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of suffering is happening in the world because of our tribalism. Um, and are we actually capable of transcending that? If you look at the evolution of us, of us as a species, you look at the nature of life as being a, essentially, um, you know, life feeds on life. Uh, can we transcend that? Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's, it seems to me that some of the more logical answers are the, the more uncomfortable answers when you're looking at these, these questions um, and that, um, <clears throat> Can I find a way to reconcile my love for life, my love for its beauty, um, with my fear that humans are not capable of redeeming themselves, that we may be doomed to destroy uh, each other because of our selfish nature? Are humans, in fact, capable of, of uh, enough beauty and uh, wonder and connection and compassion that we are redeemable? um given how much destruction we we cause um so yeah these are things i'm definitely trying to get into um in here and this writing these books has really helped me to uh wrestle with that i think um so day ravens got an answer right uh to these questions which i won't get into here but um i think it, it's fairly evident in the second book where his answer is going to go but i think i more fully explore it in the third book um so yeah I don't know if I actually answered your question or not, but <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, cool. So, Mark, uh, what would you like to say or comment on or question about book two, The Prophet of Eden? First of all, I should point out that your drug dealer strategy did work, and I got the first one for free, but I used my own fair money to buy the next one. <laughs> and we'll get one after that. Um, so, my question is um, also about the, uh, the religious aspect, but I'm expecting a less spiritual answer from from you because it's about how it turns into a magic system. So uh, it's to me that um, you have this subset of people who are born with this uh, level of power to them, but in order to, to gain the control, which is what Day Raven needs in order to do useful things with his power, um, they have to undergo a process. And part of that process, if I've got the right end of the stick, is essentially uh, a form of buddhist enlightenment that they have to to really get to the higher echelons of it they have to remove their ego from the process and to uh detach themselves to some degree from the world and the, the more they can can detach the, the more control they can get the problem being that as you detach yourself from the world the less you want and so in your example where you say well i've got this and i'm not giving it to you because it, it's mine well if you remove the ego completely you're not going to give it to them either because you no longer care about them you know either you you, st you stop caring about yourself but then why would you care about these people so it seems to me that the two main um wielders of this power have um have to put themselves in that place but then have to have some mechanism to then focus them back on the world to actually use that power. And yeah. so for the, the supreme priest, it's the religion itself, which is the, 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 the lens, if you like, that focuses him back. He can now remove his ego from the process, but he can do terrible things in the world because he is believing in this, this, this faith. Um, and for Day Raven, um, 
the process by which he frames himself and and is able to to reach back into the world when he's taken himself far enough away from it to to uh, actually have that control would be a spoiler but it's it's a different mechanism it's an interesting process yeah yeah um, but but question there is that all the other people with power hmm. they have less power but they also suffer from this and one of the most powerful people the second in command the scheming guy who has great ambitions and um and and want is huge egomaniac and wants you know the 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 treasure and the the women and the power yeah. how is he reaching this state of in, in, enlightenment where he can have this power at his disposal and focusing it back into the world if I, if i'm correct it seems like he would be the worst guy in the world to actually <laughs> be a strong guy in, in magical terms yeah so that you're talking about yoruman and yes. yeah you're you're correct actually your observation is that bledla has a way of understanding this power where to him it's all about doing edan's will it's about bringing about the kingdom of the eternal that's his focus uh dare even has a mission uh that uh he's trying to accomplish uh for for yoruman actually he is it's interesting if Yoruman were alive today he would be a scientist but I don't think he'd be a very good scientist uh, and I say that because to me and you're an actual scientist two of you are actual scientists here so <laughs> you can correct me um, but to me a great scientist has to have some humility and I'm, I'm basing this, a scientist did tell me this, my, my geography uh, professor in college uh, told me, you know, what we know, what we think we know changes all the time. Uh, and so you can't be too uh, legalistic or you can't be too dogmatic. Uh, you, you have to be flexible to, to do good science. Um, you have to listen to what you're being told. And Yoruman is not listening. He's got this vision that he wants to impose he has a mission too. His mission is to defeat mortality. He has this underlying desire that he wants because, of, and I tried to give a little bit of his own back history. He lost his mother when he was 11 years old, I believe. And uh, he has that little ring that he plays with all the time. And, you know, he's pretending he doesn't care about uh, people, but really he does. And so I think he's um, he's got his focus. His focus is he wants to transcend death. And that, that's his thing, I think. So for him, when he reaches that, that state, which I describe as being in the realm of origins, that dispassionate state, for him, it's about seeing the truth, right? He is, in, he is seeing the world as it is, not as we want it to be when he's in that state. And for him, that is the transcendent thing. Um, so that's how I would explain his engagement, his understanding of the gift, as I call it. Also, I would remark that the songs of origin are supposed to be a kind of anchor, something that tethers the, the magic user to their body. So you're right that to use the gift, you have to, you have to shift your consciousness to the realm of origins where it's you're, you're dispassionate and serene and, and otherworldly. But if you do that too much, you leave your body behind, you forget who you were, you know, you don't come back. So there's a risk there, there's a danger. And the song of origin, in part, is a is a tether that keeps you attached to the body. Um, so that's what that's meant to be as well. Yeah. Right. Everything you said there works for me, and I, I'm I'm satisfied with the answer. I would only to point out that um, the humility and science thing is probably not true. Uh, and one of ah. our greatest scientists, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, was a an egomaniac and and a rather unpleasant <laughs> person. So. Yeah, some of those egomaniacs, and I, I don't know about Isaac Newton uh, particularly, but I what I found is that often a lot of times those egomaniacs who are famous have stolen a lot of things from people that who are not household names. Um, so I can give particular examples, uh, like Edison, for example, you know, um, would be a good example of of a, of a person who's famous for inventing this and that and the other. But what we don't talk about is actually no, he he took that from this person, or he was good at claiming credit for all this stuff but um so yeah i don't know 
Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you'd know more than I would because you're, you're an actual you, scientist. <laughs> you can find examples of excellent scientists who, um, you know, have yeah. a humil good humility, people that you actually want to work with and be around, yeah. uh, but also examples of <laughs> people who are at the opposite end of the, of the spectrum, sure. um, who are both good scientists or uh, not so great scientists. So, yeah. Sometimes well, your mind would be good. one anyway, I think, <laughs> if you were around today, he would be a very dedicated, and very arrogant scientists, probably. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, in, in this particular culture and this time, this was the best access he could get to, you know, knowledge. Um, and and I, I see him as a kind of a Faustian character, actually. Um, there's a bit of a Faust in him. Uh, so, but yeah, I, I, he was my one of my favorite characters to write, actually. Um, uh, I don't know why, but he he fascinated me. And I actually added Yoramon chapters after the fact as well. I had to go back and re and insert his chapters later on because he started to become he started to become more important. Mm -hmm. Um and he gets really important in the third book, actually. So uh, uh, yep. Well, thank you for that. Um and uh Angela, what would you like to say or yeah. ask about book two? I would like to talk a little bit about this scene where we have this big battle done, where the big showdown happens and Day Raven swoops in riding the dragon. Oh. Um, and I mean, he has been on this path for this whole time where he kind of gets to grips with, okay, I need to end this war somehow. But also, if that means I have to die, so be it. You know? I'm willing to sacrifice myself here. Yeah. And um, we have other people sacrificing themselves as well. Now we had Urt already, Urt who sacrifices herself. And we have done in this battle scene, we have Arna who sacrifices himself because he is still mm -hmm. loving Galdor and he wants to save Galdor. So he sacrifices himself. So they both do this out of love. Yeah. Um, um, would perhaps, yeah, out of love to Day Raven, but also perhaps out of a bigger love for mankind, and then Anna with his specific love for um, Galdor. Um, and when um, Sequara tries to bring Day Raven back, mm. um, she can do so because um, she has her memories, of course, nice. um, but of course also she, she loves him. No? But it says then that um, Day Raven comes back not because he has a love for Sequara or a love for life, but that he has a desire for life. Mm. A desire, of course, is something quite different from love. You know? So could you perhaps comment a little bit on this um, yeah, almost triangle that we have in this chapter between love, sacrifice, and then desire? Wow, Th this actually, in a way, is very related to John's question. I think. Yeah, uh, it is. Yeah. About yeah. the Buddhism and the Christianity and and mm. all of that. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I I feel like that is the key moment um, in mm. two where Day Raven saves the day. Right, he defeats Blood mm. yeah. using this this thing that's been inserted in this terrible power. That he never wanted but has decided to try to use for the greater good um and it takes over you know in that moment he, there is no day raven anymore and mm. just this yeah he lets it take over, over. now he knows that this will be the consequence that he might just disperse into the energy of the universe yep. You know? yep. and yep. says well i'm willing to to do that to say to yeah basically sacrifice myself to end this war and unfortunately for everyone there, if Sequara hadn't been there uh, to bring him back, mm -hmm. he would have probably done what the elf wanted to do, which is to say, yeah. oh, look at all this horrible suffering. Look at these, look at these humans are doing to each other, slaughtering each other, causing all this pain here. Let's just, you know, poof. Yeah, exactly. You know, Goodbye. All their souls away and then uh, they'll all feel better. You know, um, the only reason they don't want to die is because they're so delusional and so attached to their little egos but the moment i you know dissipate their energy and return them to the greater world they won't mind at all you know uh so <laughs> that's kind of the, a very logical position uh, but 
in that with, with Sequara, Sequara bringing back Day Raven's humanity, I think there's that piece of him that wants to fight to say no. Uh, and then maybe this is where his real heroism is, is in this dialogue between Day Raven and the elf, where the elf is saying, your ego doesn't matter. You are part of the greater world. Uh, in fact, to do do the world a favor and just dissipate right now, uh, <laughs> right. You'll, you'll, there'll be a lot less suffering. Whereas Day Raven says, no, individual lives are worth it. They are, they deserve a chance. So his, his heroism is just simply in his affirmation that, uh, that an individual life does matter um, and that an individual is worth enough, is capable of enough love and compassion uh, and beauty to make their lives worth it. Um, so that, that's, that's the, uh, the, the dichotomy there, right there in that scene, mm. I think. Mm. And it's because yeah. of Sequara and, and his love for her and his attachment to her as an individual that he comes back and yes she has his memories and she restores his individuality i think in, uh, thereby but um yeah that's that's the scene where i'm really trying to figure this out um and yeah. Yeah, um I, yeah, I found it very interesting that you like i said that you use the word desire instead of love no so yeah. kind of like i mean our desires of course um linked us much much more to our egos and um our yes. attachments than love would do no yeah. So, yeah, of course, love is such a messy word, isn't it? I mean, we use in um, English yeah. this one word. When Very we're much so. We can mean a dozen different things by that yeah. word. Really. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I thought I thought desire in that moment was um, desire for life um, mm. was the more appropriate thing. Um, but I wouldn't rule out love as well. Um, you know, um, at least a certain type of love in, in that situation. So. Well, what I've read so far of the third book, we probably need the whole package, not to be fully human. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. kind of where we go in book three. Speaking of which, I guess we are we've now arrived at Return to Eden, and um, Mark has not started it. Angela is not quite done. Uh, John has finished it, so we're going to do some non-spoiler just remarks. Uh, yeah, I like what do you think of Return? I loved it. First of all, it was my favorite uh, of the trilogy. I okay. was honestly a, a little bit concerned when I got towards the end of The Prophet of Eden because it felt like you were about to wrap everything up. And yeah. I'm like, no, there's a third book. book. Don't wrap it all up. And your explanation actually... Um, makes a lot of sense um, towards uh, or with respect to the first question um, that Mark asked about how you finished the first two books and sort uh -huh. of with that. So um, did you go back and um, kind of modify the ending to book two to when you started to work on book three or was there like a greater time um, that went by before you started book three or could, could you tell us some of the history of book three in the context of the trilogy as a whole? Yeah, yeah. No, I always knew there was going to be more. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want it to end with what happens at the end of book two. And a lot of people have been, wait, what, what is he doing? This is the end, you know? And if it were a conventional fantasy trilogy, that is where you would end it. Um, but I really wanted to look at the part of the story that tends to get the uh, short shrift, which is the the return, the what happens after the hero saves the day but sacrifices everything. And if they sacrificed everything, what happens to the hero, right? What's left of this person? Uh, and what about this war that's ravaged the continent? You know, you don't just get up the next day and say, well, that sure was bad. Glad we're done with that, you know? Um, so... I really wanted to delve into that because I don't think it's done very often. Um, and it, it, there's plenty of story, I think, in that. And in fact, it's, it, it is the, the thickest of the three books. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to look at the consequences. Um, and, you know, I, um, I wrote the first two books when I was in my 30s. And as it turned out, I think the third book I wrote in my 40s. And probably it was a slightly different person um, at that point in my life. Um, and I, I hope I knew a little bit more how to write. Um, I also think that the third book is really much more my own story than the first two. I mean, I had fun with all the nods and, and you know, this is my love for this genre. That is a big part of uh, what I'm doing. 
but I think I struck out on my own uh, a lot more in the third book, uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I think you did too. I mean, the whole trilogy is very introspective, but you really took it to new depths and returned to Edan. And um, is it okay if I ask another question? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and the other two can, should feel free to, to chime in at any point. Great. So this is kind of part two to my last question. Mm -hmm. um, where I, you know, I felt like book two leaned heavily into Buddhist influences, whereas book three kind of, um, Day Raven becomes, at least how I read him, like a, a full-on Christ figure where, um, you know, he's going around, he's preaching about the importance of love and, and, you know, it sounds like something that could have come from the gospels, for example. And, um, you know, one of my, some of my favorite scenes in that book are where he kind of, doesn't expose externally the sins of other people, but he makes them see their own sins and see the horrors of what they have done and the way that they will just wail out in recognition of all the terrible things that they've done. I mean, he's, he's like bearing their souls to themselves and seeing, you know, what you've, what they have done. And, and that was just, the whole thing was just so powerful and so I wanted to ask you, um, you know, Day Raven as a Christ figure, you know, this goes back to even, you know, in Tolkien's work, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings is many right. things, all the wonderful world building, new languages, all that. But fundamentally, you know, it's a Christ allegory as well. Right. Um, the difference being, you know, Frodo, um, Frodo is a broken figure, as is Day Raven, but in different ways. Right. Um and, you know, and they are grappling with um, a source of power, which is not good. It's either, um, you know, evil or perhaps just indifferent. It's just not right. even on the spectrum of good. I'd say in Frodo's case, it's evil. In my case, it's more indifferent. Yeah. Right, right. So I wanted to get your perspectives on, mm -hmm. on that, both, you know, on following your own path to representing that, but also um, with respect to the Lord of the Rings. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, it's impossible for me to untangle all the, uh, the the Tolkien influence that's, you know, in this brain, you know, but yeah, I think that is one difference, the, uh, the evil versus the indifference. Uh, so I don't have even even characters like Bledla, for example, I tried to introduce him as kind of an evil baddie, but to get a little more nuanced with him, even in the first book. So there are certain scenes where I'm looking at Bledla and saying, well, he really does believe that what he's doing is, is going to be for the greater good of, of everyone, right? He wants to bring about the kingdom of the eternal and he really believes in what he's doing. Um, so that kind of certainty, and he has his moments of doubt even, in, in, even in the first book uh, where he meets Day Raven face to face. And he's like, wait, what if he is the prophet and i'm not you know and that's kind of a you wouldn't expect that if he were just completely evil and arrogant right his cause is more important than he is right he will give everything for that so i'm looking at that um and hopefully in a way that it gets a little nuance in there at least um i talked about yorman already who's somebody i i can see big aspects of myself in yorman and in the questions that he has and in his anguish over you know, people I love die and that's horrible. And, and life is, yeah, it's beautiful, but it's also got a lot of suffering in it. And maybe, uh, maybe the, the beauty isn't possible without the suffering. And gosh, that's kind of the deal, I guess we get here. Um, and, and how do you respond to that? Day Raven as a Christ figure. Um, so a big difference obviously is that Day Raven is clearly mortal. Um, I, I, he's not a divine, he's not a divinity or anything. I never try to assert the, his divinity or anything like that. So, um, so that's a, di that's a difference. And um, I would say that uh, in terms of though, the, the heart of what he's uh, the idea of sacrifice and empathy and love, I hope that that's a similar message there. Um, yeah. Because when I read the Gospels, I feel like that's kind of the heart of what uh, what Jesus was talking yeah. about. Yeah, that's the whole point, right? Love people. Yeah, yeah. So, excellent. Well, uh, any final thoughts or, uh, Mark, you look like you're about to say something. Well, I was about to say I was being uh, summoned, summoned elsewhere, so 
but uh, just following up on the on the Tolkien thing, um, just things that amused, entertained me, and and I liked in terms of the Tolkien parallels were that um, you know in in um, the Hobbit we have a quest to a mountain, a distant lonely mountain with a dragon in it. Um, in the Lord of the Rings we have a quest to a distant Mount Doom where we need to do something very important that will save the day and we have a holding action because all of the battles in these books are essentially holding actions no one's going to solve the problem because the 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 fight is so uneven and there's this um there are two main mechanisms whereby the power that these people that um day raven and bledler have um is able to impose itself on the army level of things which is the summing of the beasts the uh the the trolls and the whatnots mm -hmm. and then in book two the, the dragons so they become the vector which you can focus your your power through um and even in the what what john was just talking about where the book essentially they end in in book two they end where any film would end any film would just cut to the the titles now and we'd assume it sorts itself out and most books to be honest would also stop there but tolkien didn't he then mm -hmm. after they threw the ring in and the the battle was defeated you know the one and the the dark lord defeated they then went through this famous sort of seven stage ending where you go and see the <laughs> the the sort of fallout here and then we cross the country and we see the fallout here and we cross the country so in ignorance of book three, in my mind, it's kind of <laughs> like that, a sort of pro, even longer sort of um, closed Not, down. But. Yeah, I see where you would think that. Yeah, um, uh, book none, three. None of these are negative. They're, they're all positives. I, yeah. I like the fact that that it's um, it's got those echoes in it. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I that's a I think a very valid observation. That said, uh, book three is I think it's I think John said it, you said it's your favorite. Uh, it's my favorite book, uh, and so far it's gotten the most enthusiastic response overall. I think uh, as as storytelling. So there are still um, you, you've got some elements at the end of book two, uh, the Ilarkai, for example, the Bart Munzels people who are still very much active, um, if you will. So there's still plenty of action. But the emphasis is taken away from the the beasts and all of that, and is put much more on the humans, but also the elf. I promise you more elf in book three. Okay. Yeah, so lots of that to come in in book three. Uh, I think I'm going to be answered, Mark. <laughs> I'm going to duck <laughs> out. It's, it's been lovely. I'll leave you guys to close off. Thank Very you. Good. Thank, Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> And Angela, I don't know if uh, you you could probably confirm uh, what, what we were just saying as well. Uh, there's much more elf in book three. Uh, yes, there is. Yeah, um, which is appreciated. I'm not sure yet if book three is my favorite because book three gets very dark in parts. Um, mm -hmm. And I sometimes sit there and have this mantra, you're reading Philip Chase. It's not Malazan where you're in for another thousand <laughs> pages of misery. There is hope <laughs> somewhere in there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are things that I absolutely love about the third book and um, one is a structural element how it structurally goes back to the very first book you know? so in book one we have the high priest going to the dungeon and in book three we have the high priest going to the dungeon but in very different circumstances yes, no? yes. Um, and I really like that I like those kind of like, kind of like yeah the whole book one suddenly gets this foreshadowing power into book three. And I really love that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that that is something that I'm I don't mind saying I'm kind of proud of that a lot of things. And you should you should be proud of in, that. A yeah. lot of things in book one actually take on a lot more resonance after you've read book three. Like you say, there is a dungeon scene yeah. in book one and there's a dungeon scene in book three. And mm certain characters come back uh, from book one uh, to book three who are absent in book two. Uh, there are promises made in book one that are explored much more in book three, particularly in relation to Day Raven and Imhar and Imhar's family and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. Thank you mm. for making that observation. Yeah. The other thing is by um, your prose, <laughs> um, I think when it comes to, yeah, your writing, the third book is definitely my my favorite when it comes oh. to your prose, um, because um, despite all the darkness, there are also 
scenes of an enormous and gentle beauty mm -hmm. and they're conveyed in an absolutely beautiful language. Um, and that's the second thing that I really, really love about book number three. So yeah, that's, um, yeah. yeah. That was definitely a goal uh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. When, I mean, I, I never know how someone else is going to feel about the writing, um, but I definitely wanted there to be a sense of beauty. Yeah. No matter what the losses are. Um, so, yeah. And those things are very much intertwined, aren't they? You know, you they are. Yeah. Yes, they are. Yes. The and I mean, I know exactly what you mean when you say, um, yeah, we, we never know how other people will react to our creations. No? We might have an intention, but then um, what reaction we really get, we, mm -hmm. we never know. Um, yeah, as an artist, you you experience that, I'm sure, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. it's part and parcel of, of that process, I presume. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm also, I'm, I'm very glad and thankful that you uh, did not let yourself get discouraged, but um, found the courage to actually publish this and say, okay, self-publish here and put it out there. Because... Um, well, publishers have different, how shall I say, parameters up, um, to judge a book and a story. No? Right. Um, your creation becomes basically um, economic preposition and they look at financial vi viabilities and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and what they think, what the market wants at the moment. No? And um, well, when, when Mark said, well, your story wasn't really what they were looking for when I wrote my story, my story got published. But I think it's very much a story for our time, mm. the whole Edan trilogy. No? It might have things that go back, way back, no? like, for example, the, the Tolkien influence or the Beowulf influence as well. No? Yeah. Um, uh, but um, it still manages to kind of like convey something that's very re relevant for us today. So, oh. yeah. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I yeah. mean, these are... These are the human struggles, the human questions, mm. the human experience, I hope. Uh, I've, I've been able to explore some of that um, in, in this trilogy. So yeah, I really appreciate you saying that a lot. Um, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, any final thoughts, John? Um, yeah, just to uh, emphasize what Angela was saying, um, you know, you're really bearing your soul here and, and you know, so much deep mm -hmm. thought and love that went into this. So I, I want to thank you for that. I know I personally got a lot out of reading this trilogy and uh, I'm sure most of the other readers did as well and you know the questions that you're addressing here they're the same questions that um, you know have been so important to humankind for thousands of years right they, they've been addressed in uh, classic literature and in theological te texts and you know they are as Angela was saying just so important to us today as well especially when we are equipped with, you know, the technology that can, you know, push the world in either direction, one towards, um, you know, sustainability and um, you know, a positive way or one towards destruction. So in that sense, these questions are even more important now than ever. So, so thank you for giving your contribution to that. Well, all right. I appreciate that very much. I appreciate all three of you. Uh, Mark had to leave. Uh, to take care of household things, but uh, I, I am very thankful to him and to you, John, and to you, Angela. It has been so meaningful for me to be able to share this story with readers like you. Uh, that has made this experience just everything I could have ever wished. Uh, so I'm very, very appreciative of, uh, of you people. Uh, and um, I want to thank you uh, for reading the books, uh, for reviewing them, and for being here today with me to discuss them. And I hope that we will have many more discussions, uh, many more journeys to come. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you all the readers, uh, or sorry, viewers out there and readers, because uh, you're, uh, if, you're, if you're watching this now, you probably are a reader as well. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for watching this. And uh, we will have more of these discussions. But until then, take care, everybody.